Welcome to ESOL Studio, your hepatology broadcast news live from the International Liver Congress. In this episode, we will talk about uh, liver cancer screening and prevention. I'm Jean Charnot from France, and it is my great pleasure to moderate this session with uh, Lorenza Rimassa from Italy. And uh, we have uh, expert faculty on liver cancers, uh, Professor Ellen Reeves from UK, Professor Jerzy Jarosevic from Poland, Halifan Rufroner from Spain and Ruini Sharma from UK. Up to you. So uh, we are speaking about, today we are talking about uh, um, HCC uh, screening and HCC surveillance. There, we know the role of screening for, uh, in, in cancer is the, uh, to identify pre-malignant lesions or uh, early stage uh, tumors that can be cured. We have a very established uh, screening uh, plans for, as in sense for colorectal cancer where we can identify pre-malignant lesions or for, for breast cancer where we can identify um, early stage uh, tumors that can be cured. We don't have so well established plan in, uh, uh, for HCC. So my first question for our speakers is, uh, what are currently the main limitations for implementing HCC screening in, in clinical practice. So this is for Helen and Jersey. Oh. That, uh, the, there are two main limitations, really, and the first is the at-risk population that we want to screen. Uh, it's very large, it's very heterogeneous, um, and we haven't identified many of them. Um, and then for the people that we have identified, it, um, we, we have tools which we commonly use, ultrasound with or without alpha feta protein, um, and the effectiveness of the tools is something that's constantly debated. So we have a very large population with not very effective tools to try and deliver these benefits of screening. Did you want to comment on that, Rohini? I think there's been quite a lot of work looking at surveillance uptake, majority of which has been from the US. So we don't have very much work from Europe per se, or from Australasia, or from the United Kingdom. I like to think about surveillance uptake, and the barrier surveillance uptake in three different forms. So I think we can think about it as healthcare barriers, practitioner barriers, and patient-related barriers. In terms of healthcare barriers, certainly when we've tried to roll out screening beforehand, there's a lot of pushback from radiology departments in terms of there's not a lot of capacity. Um, as Helen's alluded to, the issue about ultrasound and a lot of debate around the sensitivity of ultrasound. From a practitioner level, there is still a lot of doubt in people's minds about the actual uh, utility of surveillance, and I think that's something that we need to work on in terms of addressing it. I think one of the things that we do sometimes forget about is patient level factors. And essentially, we have a group of patients which, when we've looked at this population, there's quite a lot of research to say that they're not empowered. They don't, a lot of patients don't know why they're having the surveillance. And I think there's a bit of education work that we need to do around empowering our patients so they can engage in that surveillance program. Um, there's also issues around cost, transportation, but I think these are, there are multiple barriers, and I think as a whole what we need to do now is try and move forward in terms of addressing those barriers. Yeah, I think that there has been studies showing, studies that have been done in the US or Europe where um, English is one of the languages that's commonly spoken, and it's the non-Caucasian, non-English speaking population that doesn't attend for the scans and has poorer compliance. And that comes down to us really as a, a limitation in how effective we are at explaining the purpose of surveillance to, to our patients. JJ, did you wanted to bring something yeah, up I, as well. I completely agree with, you, of, with all of you. So in Europe, we know that uh, HCC detection by surveillance is only 40%. It's only 40% of cases are uh, diagnosed by, uh, by surveillance, which is really low. But I see the, another problem is linkage to care, and it's also the ability to provide the curative uh, treatment for the patient screened. Because having the screening program without the ability to provide the treatment doesn't make sense. And again, some data. The data are from a recent meta-analysis by uh, Amit uh, Singhal in JHEP. Uh, so they, uh, they checked that curative treatment received in patients without screening is only 34%, with screening 58%. So screening increases it, but still it's only 58%. Uh, but uh, what I really like about this study and what is really important, we need to 
all of us to speak in one tongue, one, 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 one message. Screening in patients with cirrhosis is cost effective. It's important because we know that screening it's, uh, increases early detection, increases curative treatment receipt, and increases survival. And this is the message which we need to show to the European Union, we need to show to all, the, uh, all of the other organizations, because without this message, we won't be able to move forward. I, mean, I think the difficulty is, I'll let you speak. Yeah. <laughs> I think the difficulty is that we use that data to apply to non-serotic patients or yeah. other groups of That's patients, the and then the message gets confused. But you're right, if we just stick to screening serotic patients who have a 20-fold risk, really... Um, at, USG at works, AFP, AFP yeah. works, and we know how to screen this population, and we need to focus on those populations yeah. to, to really convince uh, policy makers to, uh, to implement it. A basic question, how to identify serotic patients? Because to apply the screening, maybe you... And if you don't know that you have cirrhotic, you cannot have a GC screening. I don't know what yeah, you're. This is one of the thought. most important yeah. points that has been addressed. One of the problems is that a lot of people are cirrhotics and they don't know they are cirrhotics. Uh, and then, obviously, if we want to improve the surveillance, the first step is to identify those patients at high risk of liver cancer in whom we have to recommend surveillance. And I think this is. Uh, critical point to uh, start a uh, surveillance program. For instance, in breast cancer, it's very easy. Female, uh, older than 40 or 50 years old, and then you can identify this population. Who is cirrhotic? Who knows? I mean, uh, we need to identify them. And another concept that he, you, have, you, have, you have commented, but I would like to stress again, is that the, the main aim of surveillance is not detect the disease at the real stage. The main aim should be to improve survival. And then this is critical when, for instance, we have to face patients with nephrology. This is going to be these patients are going to be the, the, the most frequent population that we have to face in the near, in the next future. Okay, we detect the disease with surveillance, but first, are we able to offer any curative therapy? Maybe not, because they are cardiovascular disease that we cannot offer curative disease. No, you. No. Many of them, <laughs> many of them, do not have cirrhosis, and yes. and and or they have advanced fibrosis. So they may have cardiovascular disease, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to try. These are patients that could potentially have a resection because they don't have portal hypertension. No, but but I would have to focus that the main aim should be to decrease the HEC mortality, thanks to the surveillance program. And again, if we detect the early disease, but we cannot offer any curative therapy, this was the, the results by the meta-analysis by Admit Singal, that despite that with surveillance, we offer therapy in a relevant proportion of patients that were under surveillance programs, they did not receive any treatment at all. And then in them, surveillance has failed. Yes, but I, I, I do think it's, the, the aim of surveillance is to reduce mortality, but it's when a person dies, they die. But curative therapies obviously prevent death at a particular point. Palliative therapies also prolong survival. Um, and so now that we have so many more palliative options coming on board from our oncologists, the modeling that's been done, that the economic cost of surveillance, it's difficult to apply it. We have to start again in some ways. Um, but, but I do think that for if a patient is not going to be lit for any therapy, there's no point doing surveillance. Mm. Um, but it doesn't have to be curative therapy anymore. It has to be life prolonging yes. therapy. Life prolonging therapy. Yes. Well, I agree with this, with this comment. <laughs> Good. And <laughs> <laughs> we have a consensus. And uh, and just to move forward, um, uh, we have said that ultrasonography every six months is a gold standard for screening, and there is uh, several uh, publication. Uh, that has suggested that we could use biomarkers, serum uh, protein biomarkers, and uh, there is a, uh, currently in the ILC uh, meeting, uh, randomized control trial, that have tested this uh, new biomarker uh, in the field of HEC screening. And Alejandro, could you say some words about that? Yes. And, uh, As you have said in this meeting, uh, one hour before, uh, the data from Toronto has been presented. This was a, a randomized study single center study, and in this study, the authors included 1,200 patients 
at, at risk of liver cancer, according to guidelines, patients with cirrhosis and patients with chronic hepatitis B, but with a, with a bridge score uh, beyond nine points, and then, according to the guidelines, at risk of, of HEC and, uh, and with recommendation for surveillance. And the authors uh, uh, randomized this population in, in two groups. The group A was the standard of care, uh, ultrasonography every six months, and the group B was the, the active arm, uh, was ultrasonography associated with, with the use of biomarker, that in this case they use the AFP, the L3 uh, fraction of the AFP, and the PIFCA DCP. And also they analyzed the GALAT score, that was a mixed uh, combination of these three markers, and also including the, the gender, the sex, and, and the age. And basically, they, they randomized the population in, in two groups, around 600 patients in each arm. Just only to, to comment that in this study, 60 65% were cirrhotics, and then they included a big proportion of patients with non-cirrhotic uh, non chronic uh, hepatitis B infection. And basically, the, the main result of the study was that the proportion, the, the number of HEC cases in each arm was 35 and 27. And, and in most cases, 80, 80 percent, around 80 percent of cases, the HEC was diagnosed at every stage. Well, that was the goal of the surveillance, but there were no differences at all between both arms. And according to the results, um, I, can, I can conclude that the adding the biomarkers to the conventional ultrasonography does not increase the sensitivity and does not uh, increase the number of patients uh, detected by, by a screening. There are some open, open questions in this study. Basically, the authors did not explain how many CT scans or MRI were performed due to increased biomarkers, the false, the false negative results of biomarkers. And this is a relevant for, um, information, basically, because as a, if you are politic and you have to invest money, a big money for the, all your country, Obviously, you ask the doctors how efficient is the surveillance, but also you ask the economist how much will cost the surveillance. And obviously, if you use a, a, a tools that are not, sen are not specific enough and you have a lot of false negative results, you will increase the, uh, the cost of the surveillance because you will need a lot of recall strategy to confirm the diagnosis and obviously uh, will increase the cost. And if you have no significant uh, increase in the efficacy, but you have a significant increase of cost, obviously the, the combination for biomarker is not cost effective. Can I comment on yeah. this? Because, I, I, of course, I like this study because it's a randomized controlled trial, which is a really strong study. But on the, hand, on the other hand, there were some nice meta-analysis before, which shown that uh, addition of AFP increase the sensitivity of USG for uh, early lesions. Yeah? And I, re I remember the study from Gastro 2018, where the uh, USG sensitivity to detect uh, early cancer was uh, only around 47%, less than 50, and adding AFP increased to 60%. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't cross out biomarkers also AFP, and uh, I also see one of very important limitations is the doctors. F to perform USG, you need a lot of time and a lot of doctors. There are some regions where we really understaffed. Like in Poland, there is the lowest number of doctors per capita in the whole European Union. And then our screening programs might not be as effective as in France because of the shortage of doctors. If we could have proper biomarkers, we could overcome this barrier. I, I think there's a, the, I, I agree with what you've said, and that um, meta-analysis, one difference is that that was in cirrhotic patients. And so for the Toronto study, perhaps there may have been a difference if they had just focused on cirrhotic patients. Um, but the other aspect to this is the heterogeneity of mm -hmm. the etiologies of the patients that they've studied. Um, because in patients with NAFL, perhaps they're obese, 
the ultrasound may perform less well. Yes. That's a group that may be more likely to benefit from a serum biomarker. So again, it's defining, it just makes the studies very, very big and very costly. But you have to know what is the cost effectiveness of what you're doing with this tool in a specific population. And it is worth mentioning that in their study, although there was no statistically significant difference and a negative study is a negative study, there were I think nine patients whose tumors were detected by the biomarker alone. Um, and in that situation, although they're not statistically significant, those patients have benefited. Some of them had early stage disease, and then they've retrospectively modeled the Gallard score um, to show that if they'd applied the Gallard score to some of these patients detected with the biomarker alone at early stage, uh, at advanced stage, they could have pos possibly have been scanned earlier. So I, I think it's just difficult to, to, they've tried to perform the perfect study and got a negative result, but it's because of a heterogeneous population and tools not being good enough. And also adding a comment, that the problem is that the, the current biomarkers, at least the biomarkers used in the Gallat model, they, it's supposed that they are increasing in liver cancer, that's true but also our biomarkers, at least AFP, that has been clearly recognized, that are prognostic. And then to use a the increase of biomarker that you know that also predicts poorer outcome as a tool for surveillance, that the final aim of the surveillance is to, in to decrease the mortality of with liver cancer, then you are using a biomarker that also is, is a predictor of poor outcome <laughs> to detect patients that are not detected by imaging you detect them just only for biomarkers, but probably this population that are only detected by biomarkers, in some cases are patients with inf infiltrative tumors, yeah. with a portal invasion, and then you detect them just only with biomarkers, ultrasonography fails, you do CT scan MRI that they, okay, you have an infiltrative tumor, okay, but the prognosis probably in this specific population, you, you will have more diagnosis, with no real impact in survival. Yeah, I mean, just only, I, I mean, it's a philosophical uh, uh, yeah. comment that, that yeah. I think well, that we have, have to keep in mind. negative ultrasound most of the yeah. time. Uh, IFP, so infiltrative tumor, difficult to see in, uh, in uh, It's in always the same US, comment, I mean, sure. okay, ultrasonography is negative, I have an EFP of 300. Yeah. Okay, I will do a, a magnetic resonance, and then you detect an infiltrative, infiltrative tumor in the dome. Okay, you have done the diagnosis, perfect. And? <laughs> yeah. and this is the, 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 the limitation. And the other limitation of biomarkers, and this is just only my, my personal opinion, is that, okay, we have a very well-described and validated recovery strategy. I mean, we have a nodule in the ultrasonography, and we know that we have to perform a CT or MRI. If we have this nodule that displays the specific vascular profile, okay, is the diagnosis is done. If not, we have to biopsy the lesion. And since the lesion is detected by ultrasonography, we can biopsy. I mean, we have very well-defined record strategy that has been validated. Okay. If that we have doesn't detect all of the cancers, but especially in the natural But if we patients. have an, a, a, an AF increase, ultrasonography is negative. You, ha you perform a, a magnetic resonance that detects three nodules that by the radiologist are not diagnosed for liver cancer, but the, they're nodules. So we need what is the, the next? Zero, we need the, so then we need the biomarkers. This, <laughs> yes, but if you don't have the confirmation, probably at the end you are wow. not diagnosing the disease at that early stage. I mean, this is, this is I mean, it's, it's complicated the use of, yeah. of biomarkers. Can I wa just one qu comment about AFP? We also need to remember that biomarkers rely on the underlying disease. And AFP is not the best for viral hepatitis because there is high turnover of the cells. Maybe that's why in this study, Toronto study didn't work. Maybe for NASH, NAFLD, it's going to be better. So we, I don't know, Helen, maybe you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what about other biomarkers that are currently in development? What, what, because I have to say AFP, it's come back to the 70s where you, you talk about AFP, so maybe there is new biomarker that uh, could be used and is more powerful to detect HEC. Well, I mean, I, I think that there is, there is hope, but the reality is that if we found another tumor-produced protein, um, again, it would be from a tumor that's heterogeneous, 
it, sort of made in more patients that have got advanced disease that you're likely to detect at a more advanced stage that may be prognostic. So you would face all the limitations and in 50 years time, we would be having the same discussion as we're having now about AFP without having implemented it into clinical practice. The clue, I think, is in the, the AFP L3. So this is the, the post-translational modification of alpha beta protein that happens more commonly in the presence of a cancer. And so it's the ratio of that, that that's something that's perhaps more specific to the presence of a cancer that might increase the sensitivity. So it isn't that's the new biomarker. I think this has marked a move in the field towards detecting things, whether it's proteins or whether it's nucleic acids or gene expression in PBMCs. It's things that happen in the circulation in response to the presence of a cancer. And that might be you want to find the thing that happens in response to the presence of an early cancer, the changes in the PBMC gene expression. Um, I think the most encouraging studies that have been done recently, they've been, is in epigenetic markers. Uh, and so um, Nagachalasani's group have been um, looking at candidates of methylation marks that they can detect. So things that they choose and then they assess methylation. In Oxford in the UK, Ellie Barnes's group has developed something called the MTAPS assay, which actually detects the whole circulating free DNA, DNA methylome. And these, they're finding signatures that are associated with specific cancer types, um, and we're hoping that there would be some things that change in early stage disease. So these things are at the, case, at the stage of case control studies, um, biomarker assay development. We're nowhere near the, the stage of proving something works for a stratificate, for a surveillance tool in, in a prospective trial, but there's some movement there that things may change from the serum. Uh, besides biomarkers, are there other tools that we can use for uh, screening, for instance, fast MRI? We have already a bit talk about MRI, but Rohini, do you think we can I use? I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of movement in terms of alternative imaging modalities. And I think, as everyone's mentioned, ultrasound sensitivity is poor. It has false positives, requires biopsies. It, it's a whole different pathway. And I think there's been work now to look at particularly abbreviated non-contrast MRIs, a 10-minute MRI scan, which is better tolerated for patients than a full clinical MRI scan. And particularly now we're used, moving towards a more naffled, heavy, uh, population, particularly in the UK, uh, having an MRI scan is much, much more accurate in terms of looking at these lesions where it's not so dependent on body habitus. Obviously, there are some patients that might not fit into the MRI scanner. That's a, that's a different, different issue. But in terms of like heavily steatotic livers or larger body habitus, at least we can visualize the liver more accurately uh, with, a, with an MRI scan. I think for me, that's actually a really exciting movement is kind of going towards abbreviated MRI scan versus ultrasound. Um, and it would be great to see biomarkers in addition to that. I wonder if the future is instead of doing anything six monthly on the entire population, we have a more stratified approach to screening whereby some patients we know will never develop an HCC and those patients we have either less frequent uh, surveillance or they don't have surveillance at all, while those that we think are high risk for whatever factor, and we don't know what those factors are, they go into a more aggressive surveillance program. And I wonder if that's what the future is going to be rather than the whole population being surveyed every six months. Uh, just to precise, in France, there is a randomized control trial that are going to begin in September, multicentric, in cirrhotic patients at high risk, stratified age, platelet, and so on, and randomized fat stem MRI versus uh, ultrasonography versus ultrasonography. We will see, because the risk also is to discover a lot of nodules. You uh, don't know what is the nodules, you will follow a patient, and so on. If you do fast MRI, the risk is you have nodules of uh, and undetermined. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that the future of, of, of surveillance is obviously surveillance will be cost effective. I mean, yeah. if, it's if a cost effective trail. It should be an, a, a yeah. cost effective thing, basically, yeah. because, okay, perfect. If you yeah. perform MRI to everyone, yeah. you will detect cancer, but it's not cost effective. Yeah. Probably the best strategy to do screening cost effective, if you have clearly exposed, is to have any tool to identify, first of all, patients with 
almost zero risk of liver cancer, and in them we don't need to do surveillance. We can, I mean, you can do sur ultrasonography to check the, the statosis, to check the fo to follow the, the cirrhosis or the chronic hepatitis, but you don't need to perform a specific ultrasonography for screening. And in the other extreme, we have patients at high risk of liver cancer that maybe in them, maybe in this subset of, of patients, we can dedicate resources, basically, to use a magnetic resonance because they are at very high risk of HEC um, development, and in them we need a very accurate tool to avoid false negative results. The question is, which, which tool can we use? I don't know. I mean, we already have those tools. Yes. In hepatitis B, for instance, we have clinical tools to detect yeah. those at very low risk of liver cancer. I, 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 can, I, I can give you some numbers. Yes. So the study by uh, George Papatorodidis uh, from uh, last year, JHEP reports, 2,000 patients had been infected on nukes. And then what is important? The risk of hepatocellular carcinoma decreases after five years, but not diminishes. So after 10 years, the risk is uh, still more than 9%. But using the page B score has negative predictive value of 99%. So maybe to develop those scores for all the etiologies, and as you say, then we can use those modern techniques to increase sensitivity. This is a good, good, good approach. And, and even the biomarkers tries to diagnose the disease. I mean, when the people develop or discover biomarkers, they want to prove that these biomarkers are able to diagnose the disease. But I will be very uh, uh, conflictive. Perhaps the biomarkers should be used to identify patients with zero risk of liver cancer. It's the opposite. I mean, you can do, I think you include patients that according to the age, gender, the degree of fibrosis, and also if you add any biomarker or combination of biomarkers that if negative, you can completely rule out that this, this patient has a liver cancer, this is fantastic. The only fantastic. problem with that is the prevalence of NAFLD and simple mm. steatosis. Um, and the risk of those people developing an HCC is so small, but because it's so common, we've got hundreds of them. In my, in my clinical practice, it's like 30 patients a year. So the biomarker is the stratification it's the stratification biomarker, it's the polygenic risk score, it's the genetics, it's the biopsy that showed you something else in that patient that puts them at risk. Because you can't just say their risk is very, very, very small based on demographic factors alone and the fact that they've just got um, no NASH. But again, if we are not able to identify those NFLD patients without cirrhosis that are at some risk of liver cancer, then surveillance will be not cost effective because we have a Maybe. huge amount of patients yeah. with, we'll with metabolic it. syndrome. Uh, and we will have <laughs> in the next future in Europe a huge number of patients with diabetes, hypertension, obesity. Uh, like, okay, we will check there is not significant fibrosis, they are not cirrhotic, but as you say, they have higher risk of HCC development compared with the normal population. I think if they're fit enough to treat, which is your mm. point from earlier, um, then um, if we can have some kind of stratification tool, because in, the, in them an ultrasound would probably work because they haven't got cirrhosis. As long as you can s see their liver, you'll detect a nodule easier than in a cirrhotic patient. So there may be more role, but it's not cost effective mm -hmm. if you have to do an ultrasound in you know, in millions, 100,000 people. Millions of patients. I mean, <laughs> just only for um, detecting a, a, so, a minority so of So the focus for me is understanding is the, the, the risks in mm. those patients and coming up with the stratification. The page B score has been shown to work for mm. patients with hepatitis B. So we need something like that for the mm. patients with NAFLD. Probably in hepatitis B we need the universal vaccina vaccination for <laughs> the yeah, patients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to try to improve uh, liver care and liver, liver cancer care and prevention is implemented at the TANASCs. Uh, uh, just to, which are the main objectives of this uh, TANASC? So uh, I only like to say that, that I like your this discussion here, which are here very much, but we still need to focus about one clear idea. Please remember this. We need to screen the patients with cirrhosis. 100%, okay? So, so that all of us experts show the same message. 
to a uh, to the authorities to to to, to other specialties. Okay, but it's, it's important. And then ten asks is an open letter from ESL to uh, European Parliament, European Commission, a. Uh, in order to prevent deaths of uh, uh, liver cancer, we need to change some things. And those things, of course, is awareness of the cancer, is collaboration with other specialties like oncologists, is to implement diagnostic uh, measures, uh, screening, surveillance programs to national uh, guidelines, but not only guidelines, but also procedures yeah, on the national level. And then we also need to a uh, to work towards the modifying the risk factors of, uh, of, uh, of cirrhosis. So many, many asks, but uh, we believe that uh, going in this direction will change a lot in, in, in Europe. So I think there is a lot more to, to, do, <laughs> to do, to speak about uh, liver cancer screening and the prevention of the risk factor also. It's very important, but uh, we have to, uh, to move forward. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, to have participated in this ESL studio and uh, specifically uh, Lorenza, my uh, co-chair, but all of the speakers. And uh, tune in this evening in the, for ESL studio tea time. I will be here. And uh, you are, yeah, it's me also. You are daily debrief li live from the International Liver Congress 2022. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much.